Northward to Nome, assignment to the Arctic. From the United States to Calgary and Edmonton, then 500 miles on to Dawson Creek, the beginning of the famed Alaska Highway. Then that plunge on into 1,500 miles of wilderness through Fort Nelson and Whitehorse to Fairbanks. Then, by plane on north to Nome and beyond, into the Arctic Circle. Here is something new to us, completely new. Northward to the Arctic. And now it's time for us to head on north, northward to Nome and the Arctic Circle, for the balance of our assignment. We load ourselves aboard another plane and take off. Nome is one of those unforgettable spots in history. It sits along the beach of the Bering Sea just under the Arctic Circle. Main Street is the width of one row of houses back from the sea, yet the beach itself is where the remnants of gold rush history lie. Here, half buried by the sand, is the litter that was once known. Old cars, a locomotive from gold rush days. Another old car and litter. On the other side of Main Street is the public school and more permanent buildings. Along the street itself are places of business, the Board of Trade, the Gnome Nugget, the Glue Pot, and the usual group of storefront squatters, even in this far north part of the world. Eskimos with summer parkas are everywhere, and Eskimo children with ice cream cones. Even bubble gum has found its way up here, so children must be the same in Brooklyn, Kokomo, or Nome. You might not see this in Brooklyn or Kokomo, but this young lady has certainly found the answer to babysitting. She takes the youngster right along with her. And out along the beach from downtown Nome, we find another part of our far north assignment. Here, the Eskimos who live on King Island, out in the Bering Sea, come every summer to this beach in their huge skin boats, bringing their dogs, women, children, and ivory with them. During the summer months, they stay here, live under their boats and in temporary shelters, carve their ivory, trade it for money or things they need, then get back in their boats before the first storms of winter set in and head once again for their island home. They are expert craftsmen, these Eskimos, and the work they do is lovely indeed. You see them here now with their tools, cutting, sawing, drawing figures of the animals they know so well, then carving them into the fine ivory, which is the basic item of trade, barter, and livelihood among the King Island Eskimos. The ivory comes from the tusks of walrus, which the Eskimos hunt and capture during the winter months. Here are some of the items these people carve. Salt and pepper shakers, relish and pickle forks, letter openers. And in one of the stores downtown, we find a large assortment of beautiful pieces. So we arrange with the owner to photograph the display. Here it is. Necklaces, bracelets, desk pieces, cribbage sets, decorative pieces, all of them carved by hand by the craftsmen from King Island in the Bering Sea. But we are not through yet with our northbound trip because we are still short of the Arctic Circle. We take to the air again and head out over ice-covered sea toward Kotzebue. As we see at first, it looks like a few squat shacks hovering between sea and water-filled tundra. Kotzebue is essentially a fishing village. Its people are hunters, hunters of the sea. More white people come here now than before the war, tourists, traders, government people, but the village still retains its Eskimo identity, and fishing for small fish, or the big white beluga whale, is still Kotzebue's principal industry. Hedging in Kotzebue's back doors is the tundra, a treeless, permanently frozen waste. Only the top few inches of the ground thaws out in the summertime, and this land of the Arctic becomes a solid carpet of flowers. The beach is the workhouse of the Eskimos. 
Every home has its trellis of poles covered with drying fish and whale meat. For it is during the summer months, with almost 24 hours of daylight, that food must be gathered for the equally long days of winter darkness. And every man in the village hunts and fishes constantly. Principal source of food is the white beluga whale, which weighs about a thousand pounds. It is caught, towed in, and cut up on the beach by these villagers. Here, a man and his daughter hang up the last strips of the whale he had brought in two days before. The white strips are food for man, while much of the darker strips are food for dogs. When the white strips are dried, the next job is performed by the woman of the house. She must boil the fats from the meat, skim them off, and store them away for winter use. The remaining meat is staff of life for young and old. To them it is candy and bread, dessert and meat course, luxury and necessity. The woman's sister is here to help too, but with twin boys and a multitude of dogs, she is pretty well occupied. But now we must go out with these men to fish for the white whale. Often they are gone three or four days without a catch. Perhaps today they will be more lucky. They sit together for a while, then finally get up and ready their high-powered rifles. Whales should show most any time now. Suddenly there is a call and the rifles go to the men's shoulders. Then action begins. Yes, this is a lucky day, unusually lucky. The whales are showing, and the sea is a churning whirlpool as a volley of lead is poured at the big fish. Now they have cornered one in shallow water, and a harpoon is thrown into it, so it won't get away. The fight is soon over, and the hunt goes on. Another whale shows, but disappears, and the sea is scanned for his next appearance. Soon it shows again, and the bullets fly. Then two more come to the surface. This is good, say the men. Perhaps now there will be sufficient winter food for hungry mouths in Kotzebue. For six hours we chase whales, and when four are securely bagged, the men call it a day, a very rare day for them. Sometimes, as I said earlier, they hunt for a week and don't get a single whale. Back along the course of the morning hunt, we now retrace our way picking up the three whales left behind. To tow these fish, their heads must be securely tied. This is done by threading ropes through the jaws and securing those ropes to the boat frame. The men work easily. They know exactly how each step of the process should be done. As the work goes forward, concentration is written on the faces of the men. But when the last rope from the last whale is solidly knotted aboard, those faces relax. It has been a fine day. So we come back in off the sea with our flag flying. The villagers will greet the boat gladly because four belugas in one day is a fine catch. We help them pull the big fish out onto the gravel. Tomorrow, it will be cut into more thick strips for drying. And next day, the men will hunt again, hunt for food beneath the stars and stripes north of the Arctic Circle. <laughs>